Hey folks, we're going to do a not so Q&A video here this afternoon. What you're seeing right here is a chart that is actually found in one of our books, The Next End of the World. And it contains a lot of information. I would say if you've been on it, if you've got the books, if you've been watching the videos, you might know a lot of this stuff already, but to actually have it put together in one place, I've been told by a lot of people that this is actually one of their favorite pages in the entire book, so I figured we'd go over it. Now, we're gonna start with the nice pretty colors down at the bottom. This is basically a timeline of what has happened in terms of awareness and knowledge of the catastrophe cycle. So let's start down here on the left side of this chart, and I don't have it go, I don't have it going back centuries, but it really could. I just have the first date line on there being pre-1940s. Duluth, Cuvier, Walker, Hibben, um, so many others recognize this catastrophe cycle. They've been writing about it for a couple of centuries. They all pretty much came to the same conclusions, and many of them actually predicted the next uh, pole positions to be the Bay of Bengal and South America, which is just so happens to be where the 1900s math uh, it says it's going to be where the actual observed pole motions right now suggest they're going to be. And just none of that existed back in the previous century. So we actually have three different things coming together telling us where the new poles of Earth are going to be. Um, and then not really a lot happened um, until Major White took Project Nanook up to the Arctic. Now, for those who don't know, if you haven't read the book, haven't watched the playlists, uh, Project Nanook was a mission to go up to the Arctic to do two things. Learn how to navigate in the Arctic close to the magnetic pole because using your GPS and magnetism up there is a little different when you know you start your flight and the North Pole is there and then it's behind you by the end of the flight. Um, and also to figure out the best way to watch for Russia coming over the top. Um, it was the times. And so it was throughout that mission and in the aftermath of that mission, which was, you know, started at about the orange line there, to the red line where we have all of the documents that Major White actually gave to us, uh, kept technically illegally, but thank goodness he did, to give to his son to publish many years later. Uh, and that's the red line where the Pentagon, the OSS, uh, if you don't know, that is the predecessor group to the CIA. Um, they determined that it was a 12,000-year cycle. It included the magnetic flip and the turning over of the Earth. Uh, down below that, you can see the kind of gray horizontal line. We don't know exactly when Einstein figured out the math and came to the conclusion based on the preponderance of the evidence that the Earth also did this. But we do know he did that completely independent of Major White, Project Nanook, all things like that. And the span of that gray line there is from when we first have some indication he was looking into this up until, you know, a couple months before his death, which we presume would be the latest he really could have given Charles Hapgood all of those writings that ended up being in the foreword of Hapgood's book. Pink line there, Charles Hapgood, very intentionally tanks the entire field of catastrophism. Uh, he did this in a very limited hangout. Uh, if you don't know what that is, look that up. Charles Hapgood, who at the time was working at the CIA, he was previously working at the OSS and had all this information, knew all of the right information, and instead kept the CIA thing quiet, moved into the public world as a professor, and put out this wildly twisted and deranged and completely factually false version of the catastrophe, which was easily debunkable, and then took out the entire field once people uh, debunked it. If you haven't seen our videos on how Hapgood intentionally tanked the field of catastrophism to help keep it a secret, that's in our playlist uh, and in our books, and it is a very, very interesting story. Then, of course, we have the Chan Thomas version, which was largely swept under the rug. That was in the middle of the 1960s. Um, he got a lot of things right, a couple things wrong, um, and that's not even you know a matter of opinion. 
there's stuff in his original work that actually contradicts each other. Um, we go over that as well. Um, it came out, some people heard about it. Um, largely it went unnoticed because at that point the world was already starting to say, oh, catastrophism, didn't we get rid of that with Hapgood? Anyway, it wasn't until the 1970s that Doug Vogt came out with this idea that the sun does Nova. And unfortunately by that time, interest in catastrophism was going from a raging burning fire down to little smoldering embers. And it did not receive the respect or attention that it truly deserved. Um, <clears throat> if not for Charles Hapgood, both Chan Thomas <clears throat> and Doug Vogt probably would have had a much more influential play over the entire world, scientific discourse, things like that, than they actually ended up having. Um, up next, we're going to go and we see this very wide, lighter blue line. Um, and that actually probably should extend all the way back to the pink line. But the NSF, the National Science Foundation, hand in hand with the CIA, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, they began overwhelmingly funding studies that would come out with something contrary to the idea that this catastrophism thing was real. Basically, Charles Hapgood th threw the ax and then the National Science Foundation helped scientists little by little kick a dead horse or a dying horse at least. But while that was going on, turns out Earth... The sun, the universe, they are snitches. And you couldn't just hide this from people who had a good brain. That's when Robert Felix, August Dunning, uh, Randall Carlson, Robert Schock, Anthony Peratt, one of my favorites, Paul Laviolette, Billy Yelverton, and myself um, started to really figure out, wait a minute, no, this story's not right. There's, there's something else going on here. And... Then we have 2018, where we had the declassified document containing the Adam and Eve story from Chan Thomas. Now, I am aware that there were portions of it, um, including the second version, which never actually were classified and hidden in that way uh, so overtly. But at the same time, most people didn't know about it at all. No, nobody had any idea about this. Now, I know we're going to get some people in the comments section. I heard about it. I was one of those people who heard about it. Well, one, good for you. Second, the way that I see people commenting about that makes the point. You were special if you knew about it. Most people didn't. But when that came out in 2018, we got our hands on it when just, just a couple of months and, uh, we ended up making that story called The Next End of the World, CIA Classified. And that video's got millions of views. That's what actually inspired Jimmy from Bright Insight to really take what he was already starting to figure out he was, credit where it's due. But that really kind of shifted his gear and allowed him to figure out so much more. Um, it shifted the gears of so many people and it really was the birth of catastrophism back in 2018 there. And since that time, you know, compiling millennia of geologic evidence, compiling centuries of human research into this. Since just 2018, we have tripled the amount of information that has come out in the peer-reviewed journals or modern observations corroborating this or modern awareness of galactic astrophysics or plasma physics, things like that, which help corroborate and fill in all the little holes of the story. So that's your basic timeline. Now, what we have up top there is a list of some of the people, theorists, and what they think is going to happen. Now, I'll admit this chart is a couple years old. Some of these things may have been altered, may have changed in some people's minds. And if that is the case, like I said, I'm just presenting the chart that was absolutely true back in 2020 when we released uh, the book next end of the world so let's start up at the top august dunning good friend of mine formerly of nasa formerly of jpl very much has uh admitted and oftentimes actually presented on the lies of that mainstream as he jumped from the mainstream into our community which isn't an easy thing to do big props to him 
He believes it is the, about the 12,000 year cycle. He believes in the solar outburst. He is open to the idea of the possible galactic trigger, although I think in the last couple of years he's become even more open to that possibility. He does believe there is some kind of a crustal disruption just in general. He doesn't or at least back then he didn't really say much about the specifics and he does think it's coming here in the coming decades. Robert Schock, um, he tends to talk more about the major super flaring, um, although he has actually shifted a lot more in the last couple of years. You know, on the thousands of years scale, he believes it's a solar outburst. I don't know if Robert Schock to this day has talked necessarily about the crustal disruption uh, aspect of it, although he has been one of the best examples of somebody who has every reason in the world to be stubborn and set in their ways. And yet when he's presented with new information, he throws his ego in the trash and he goes after that fact. He goes after the new evidence and he allows it to help change his mind. Really an impressive character. Uh, Dr. Paul LaViolette believes it's 12 to 13,000 years. He believes it's a galactic super wave. Unfortunately, the problem with that is that is a light effect. There would, and you know, it's the kind of thing where when it arrives, it's here and there's the disaster. There wouldn't be these decades of pre uh, events leading up to it like we're seeing right now. Not to mention that in the millions of galaxies we see in the universe, we've never actually noticed a galactic shockwave with any of them. But he does believe that the next one is coming, but sometime in the coming centuries. Um, of course, we have Doug Vogt, who believes it's exactly a 12,068 year cycle. He believes it is a solar nova, believes it's universal clock cycles. He believes Earth stops spinning and then rotates the other way, which is something of a deviation from our tilt idea. And he believes the next one's coming in October 2046. And you can go down the list there and, and see what a lot of the other folks say. Uh, of course, um, you know, impactor theorists would be like Randall Carlson, Graham Hancock, and other folks like that. I think I have quite thoroughly and repeatedly gone over how there are impacts with the solar micronova, but with just an impactor, you can't get nova level isotopes, you don't get the magnetic shift on the planet, you don't get global upticks in volcanoes, and you don't get a cycle. Um, where we come down is a combination of looking at all of these people, and yes, I'm the last one on the list there, looking at what all of the people who came before us have done. And while I'm standing on their shoulders, looking at modern observations, taking into account the most recent and best information on plasma physics, galactic astrophysics, stellar astrophysics, geophysics, both now and into the past, all of those things coming together, we believe it is about a 12,000 year cycle. It includes the solar micronova due to a galactic magnetic reversal and everything coming with the galactic current sheet. We do believe there is a 90 degree tilt that tilts back every 12,000 years. And we do believe it is coming by the 2030s or 2040s. So again, this, I've heard so many times people say this is like their favorite page in the book. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background on that. Hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you in the morning for the daily show. Be safe, everyone.